about treating polymers or composite materials as transversely isotropic composites. So let's take an example of a composite or laminate that we've been dealing with um, previously, which is this kind of matrix and fiber composite material, where uh, we're going to call this transversely isotropic, i.e. there's going to be uh, basically Ion's modulus that are the same in two directions and then but there are not equal one direction i.e. just like we dealt with in the previous problem we saw that we pulled if we pulled axially or longitudinally our Ion's modulus longitudinal was much greater than our Ion's modulus transverse direction so let's look at uh, and actually let's consider a similar idea and look at kind of how we're going to treat uh, basically mechanics problems and mechanics problems with these transversely isotropic composites. So if you look back and if you actually remember back into our lecture, let's go back all the way to lecture 12, where we were dealing with kind of those anisotropic materials. We talked about uh, basically orthorhombic materials having nine independent uh, components uh, in this really kind of nasty looking uh, kind of tensor right here, or not tensor, but a matrix. So we have nine independent components in our stiffness or our compliance matrix. Uh, and hopefully remember back to kind of these definitions that are going to come back uh, actually right now. <laughs> so let's go ahead and let's uh, kind of figure out how we're going to solve some of these problems. So let's go ahead and look at uh, our first example. So this would be our, again, our compliance. Uh, basically, here's going to be our compliance matrix and then our stiffness matrix. Or actually, this will be our stiffness matrix here. And our compliance matrix would be this example right here. So this is the most general form if we're dealing with, again, a transversely isotropic composite material. Um, so what it's meaning, what it's saying here is that you could see the fibers are aligned in the 1, 1 direction. So my E11 is much greater than E22, which is equal to my E33. If I pull in the 1, 1 direction, it's going to be stiffer than if I pull transversely, either in the 2, 2 direction or in the 3, 3 direction. So my Young's modulus will be, you know, less stiff as we saw previously. So um, we also know, actually ignore this for a second, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. In this um, matrix, we know that we have these conditions of our matrix has to be symmetric. So I know that this component must be equal, this component, and this component must be equal, and this component, and this component must be equal. Basically, again, that matrix must be symmetric, so we have the following conditions as well um, from our tensor symmetry operation. So uh, let's con uh, consider a simple scenario when we're looking at uh, basically our matrix in plain stress uh, and strain conditions. So let's look at an example right here where I have uh, essentially my stress tensor. I have a stress in the 2-2 direction. I have a stress pulling in the 1-1 direction, a normal stress, and then I have a shear stress in the 2-1 direction. So in that other notation, remember that sigma 1 corresponds to this, sigma 2 corresponds to this, sigma 3-3 corresponds to sigma 3, sorry, which is equal to 0 here. And remember that tau 1, 2, or equivalently, this was equal to this. So uh, again, this is kind of our plain stress configuration. You can kind of see it a little bit more simply uh, drawn out here. So if we have these plain stress conditions, my screen is in three direction, I know that I have a stress here, here, this is going to be zero, this is also zero, this is also zero, and I, this is all that's remaining here. So, equivalently, I know that if these stresses are zero, I know that this strain will be zero, this strain will be zero, but this will be non-zero. Uh, and this will also be non-zero as well. Um, so, we can actually write this in a little bit more uh, and simplify, again, if we're dealing with plane stress, if we're dealing with this condition where stress is confined to one plane specifically, uh, in this example, uh, you can see it's in the one two plane. But um, if we're only in, if we're in plain stress conditions, we could rewrite this kind of nasty looking matrix in a more attractive form, like you see right here. So this is just the same matrix seen below. So if you look at here, so remember because this is zero, our strain the one one is just going to be this this. Why does this go to zero? Because this is zero, so that cancels out, and there's no other kind of contributions here. Um, what about my two two? It's this times this this. So basically this component times here, this component times here, and this component times here goes to zero. And that cancels out as well. And then strain 3, 3, we're not interested in that. We also can have my strain 6, 6, which is just going to be this, this, and then nothing. So we can write this in this uh, expression right here. 
So this is great. Again, if I'm looking, if I'm pulling in this, you know, along that principal axis, I'm good to go. I could plug in, I could look up these values here, uh, this value, this value, and I could solve essentially for this problem. Now, uh, the question is, uh, you know, this is great, but under what conditions are we usually pulling along the exact principal directions? Not always. We're going to be dealing with, you know, more complex stress states, uh, uh, basically, especially along arbitrary directions with regard to principal axis. So, how are we going to solve for uh, basically some arbitrary rotation? Well, we're going to do just like we did previously, more circle linear algebra, and we're going to use our transformation matrix as we've done previously. So if I want to try and uh, transform the stresses, all I'm going to do, the stresses in the new direction, which again, just this x, y, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You could kind of rewrite this as my, the new stress and the sigma one, you know, stress prime, two prime, and, you know, one, two prime direction is going to be equal to t times one, two, and one, two. Or, you know, again, this doesn't have to be one, two. This could just be the six. Here, I'm going to this. You could also just rewrite this expression here as sigma one. I'll just do it here. One, one, two, two. One, one, two, two. And then I already could do it like this. Sigma so one, two, and six. If you want to keep it in that notation. It's just a change in notation. Something different. So if I want to change the... Let me just finish this out. If I want to change... Uh, or transform my stresses uh, after some arbitrary rotation, all I'm going to use is that transformation matrix T, and everything works out. Why? Because we know that our tensorial definition of stress is equal um, to and for both our normal and shear stresses. Now, what about if I want to rotate my uh, strains, my tensorial definition of strains? Well, again, typically we have to use introduce this Reuters matrix because of that complication with the um, shear, uh, basically, the tensorial versus the engineering definition of shear strain. So let's break this down and see how this works. So if I want to rotate and get to my uh, new expression right here, let's actually define uh, the Reuters matrix. So our Reuters matrix is equal to like one, one, two. Let's go ahead and confirm that. <laughs> let's go all the way back into lecture 12. So let's confirm that. That is our embroidered matrix, and I'm not imagining things way back. That's a dense lecture, but a very good lecture if I don't say so myself. Yep, so that's our embroidered matrix here. So again, we have to end factor that, uh, we have to introduce that factor too. Why? Because again, this, um, uh, this kind of nature of our tensor definition is half of our shear, our engineering shear screen. So what's happening here? Let's go back all the way. Excuse me for the jumping back and forth, but it's required for this one. So this is our Reuters matrix. So initially, in order to transform to my new coordinate system here, and again, you can just rewrite that in a different form as well, I'm going to take my original strains in my original coordinate system, and the first thing I'm going to do is multiply it by the inverse of R. Well, what is R inverse? Well, it's just going to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 half. So what this operation is doing, this first chunk, this, uh, this vector times this rotation matrix, all that's doing is converting to this, this, and this. Why is that possible? Because we know that my tensor definition of steer strain is equal to this divided by 2. So that's it. That's all this first operation. I'm going to color this in blue. That's all this is doing. So I'm just converting it to this tensor definition. Then I'm going to multiply by my transformation matrix. So that will take this component here and switch it to prime. So that's good as well. But to get to my final state, I have to do one last uh, operation. I'm going to switch one more color. So just do gray. I have to multiply again by R. So what will R do to this? Well. It will multiply, if I multiply this by 2, I'm going to transform this into this. Just ex prime, y prime, ooh, one more down, and then ex y prime. That's giving me that last solution. So that's how you break down, and again, that's what we're doing when we're transforming these into these arbitrary coordinate systems. So 
That's how you would uh, deal with strain. Now, you could take this in our new coordinate systems, the strains in our new coordinate system. Um, so let's go ahead and actually break that down and see what's going on here. Um, first, a quick note, there's a little bit of a, actually, a little typo in here. This should be uh, gamma one, two. So let's go ahead and break this down piece by piece. So what happens if I do this operation? The result will be I get back my original coordinate system, x, y. So that's what happens when I do that operation. So that's just given from, again, up here, if you take that inverse. Now, if I multiply this result here, my red, times this s, well, this is exactly what we're kind of seeing up here. So this is our s tensor right here. This is stress and strain. So if I multiply s by my original coordinate system, which is this, that will give me this, my strain in the original coordinate system. So my blue result will be this, this, and it will give me this. And if I multiply that by my inverse Reuters matrix, that will give me, because I know this is multiplying by that by a half, so I know that my this is equal to gamma xy over 2. So my result of this will be, again, this is going to be my tensorial definition of strain. And when I do that, then I transform it. So that will give me basically the stress tensorial definition, my new coordinate system. And then finally, let me find one more color purple today. If I do my final operation, that final R, multiplying that by 2, that will give me this. So you can see I'm going to give you lots of nasty problems <laughs> by giving you some of these values, asking you to solve, looking at these kind of um, series of linear equations and knowns and unknowns. So we'll do some more example problems like that. But this is it. I mean, this is basically, you know, when you're dealing with these composite materials, if you're looking for plane stress, you just reduce it and then you look at these operations uh, and play around with these linear algebra combinations to see solve for whatever the unknowns are uh, in your system. So we'll be doing some more example problems on your problem set and also on the exams as well. And there's a nice little kind of discussion here you could read through um, if you kind of are looking for some more uh, physical intuition in terms of these composite mechanics. So next time we're going to get into yielding and then that'll be it for MEG 202. All right, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.